Hello. Have you heard of the Blue Beetle? No, not the recent ones. I mean this guy, the original. Well, as far as DC continuity before the reboot was concerned, anyway. Dan Garrett was a reboot himself, really, following in DC's footsteps with the remakes of their Flash and Green Lantern characters. Charlton Comics recreated the Blue Beetle from scratch. Ish. His secret identity is still Dan Garrett, but here spelt with two T's instead of the original's one. And he looks fairly similar, but where the Golden Age Dan was a cop who took special vitamin pills to gain superpowers, Silver Age Dan is an archaeologist who discovers an ancient mystical artifact that grants him his powers. The Silver Age Dan Garrett stories are published across two five-issue runs from 1964 to 1966, and they're some of my favorite So Bad It's Good comics. That's enough history for now, though. We all know what we're really here for. Comedy gold! So let's get started with issue one. Issue one, according to comics.org, is scripted by Joe Gill and penciled by Bill Fraschio. The cover shows Dan swinging through what seems to be an American city based on the characters depicted. Well, Giant Mummy tries to grab him. It should be noted that the story does not take place in the U.S., and Dan doesn't tend to swing around on ropes. So we're inconsistent right out of the door. The title of our story is The Giant Mummy Who Was Not Dead. The comic itself opens with a splash page of action from later on in the story, because drawing you in is apparently the job of the inside of the book and not the cover itself. Alright, I know this is a thing in the Silver Age and not just a quirk of this series, but it always seemed weird to me. And of course, what opening page teaser would be complete without a giant wall of text? Particularly hard to read text, too. I think I'll skip it, though. I wouldn't want to spoil the story for you. The story proper opens with Dan meeting with the directors of the museum. What museum this is isn't made clear. Dr. Garrett. We thought you would be delighted to lead the expedition to investigate the presence of pre-dynastic treasures at, and the location is cut off, either by loss of quality in the book it was scanned from, or by misprint, I'm not sure. Normally, I should be, but you probably have not been kept informed considering the nuclear devices which were already exploded in the area. Nuclear devices? Wouldn't this be all over the news? Why haven't these guys heard about this before? Dan figures it would be safer to wait until the whole thing blows over, though I do wonder if everything there will be safe in the meantime with a new cappy nut job on the loose. And why is Dan just examining random artifacts while he talks? Later at Dan's house, the doorbell rings. A woman who identifies herself as Lurie Hoshid is there and asks to come inside. But Dan is reluctant until she removes her coat. You are garbed as a dancer in the court of Abydos, 1305 BC. Is there any significance? And just look at him! I doubt it's just the historical significance of the outfit that has him so excited. He apologizes and invites her in, making the excuse that he'd been busy when she'd tried to meet with him before, and she explains that his constant dodging of her drove her to this extreme, to use what you Americans call an advertisement. What? She tells him that she comes bearing a warning. The place the museum was planning to send him is the tomb of the evil pharaoh, ka f -ri. But wait, Dan isn't going, is he? Well, he is now! And so is she. This was apparently exactly what she was going for. But why? She was coming to warn him. He already turned it down because of a nut job that's been setting off nuclear weapons. This plan sounds suicidal! We cut abruptly to Egypt, where a caption explains in far too many words the care that must be taken in unearthing ancient ruins. And as the entrance to the tomb, and a statue of the pharaoh are uncovered, Lurie tells us that he was an evil, evil man, reputed to be allied with the powers of darkness. You are superstitious, Professor Hoshid. You need a change. Will you dine in Cairo with me tonight? Yeah. Make fun of her while you're asking her out on a date. Real smooth. But I guess she likes being made fun of, because she agrees, on the condition that he call her by her first name instead of saying professor all the time. Can you not say Lurie? Try it. Very well, Lurie. And we'll have a wonderful time. Oh, Dan, it is so very depressing here. You were the one who wanted to come so much, lady. Dan flies Lurie into Cairo on a very pink plane, and we're treated to a script mistake. Aircraft and expeditions seem to be transposed here. You look lovely, Lurie. Thanks for showing us, by the way. In less than 30 minutes, we'll be in the most expensive restaurant in Cairo. Dan, look down there! Long-range missiles, 
and what look to be nuclear warheads. Who has nuclear weapons in this part of the world? You were just talking about them at the beginning of the book. You already knew about them. Anti-aircraft guns take aim at them, but thankfully the nukes stay in place. Though the previous panel indicates they were making a run for it, Dan now decides he wants to turn around and give them a piece of his mind. What happened to the calm, rational Dan from the beginning of the story? Is this man who wants to take on military-grade hardware unarmed even the same person? Lurie talks him out of it, explaining to Dan what he already knew, and she even says as much, that his general Amenhotep, although it was spelled Amentohap earlier, descendant of a mighty ruler of Egypt, operating out of worthless, disputed territory, an unwanted wasteland. Well, why is it disputed, then? And how did an unaffiliated general gain access to nuclear missiles? And of course, being the villain in a comic, Amenhotep dreams of conquering the world. They arrive at the restaurant, and who should be there? But Amenhotep, of course. Idiot! If I ruled here, I would have you crushed by heavy stones! Be gone, and do not attempt to serve me again! He's ruining our dinner with his bad manners. And I want to say a few words about his machine gunners, too. Excuse me, Larry. Dan approaches him, but Amenhotep's goons advance on him, grabbing hold of his arms so that the general can beat him for daring to show his foreign face. I should probably know that every face in this comic is colored the exact same. Dan breaks free and punches Amenhotep in the stomach and then books it. Never mind his safety or the safety of his date. If you piss off Dan Garrett, he will punch you. The next day, they return to work next door to the guy they just pissed off, and finally enter the tomb, and Lurie says it smells evil. Never has my flesh crawled with fear as it does now. Dan points out again that she's not being scientific about this, though his dialogue implies that he is frightened as well. The art, on the other hand, shows him bored out of his mind. Lurie knows that the workmen are missing, and as they return outside, they see that the workers have not only fled the tomb, but are seen running off into the distance. Dan notes that, I've never seen anyone that afraid of a ghost story before, and wonders why they've run so far away. They return to the tomb, and soon, here is the actual mummy of Kaefri. Look at that beautiful scarab, carved in the precious stone. Hmm, what's this lever? Yeah, messing with that seems to be a brilliant idea. Thankfully, all it does is open the skylight. Kaefri must have preferred natural light. Lurie is worried, though. Dan, this inscription says that Ka Efri will live when the white hot light touched him again. White hot? The sun? Or an atomic blast? Yeah, that's the logical conclusion. Ancient Egyptians were well versed in modern weaponry. This blue scarab, resting on the evil mummy all these centuries, standing sentry duty, guarding the evil lying here, or acting as the jailer of Ka Efri, holding him a prisoner here in his tomb. Dan, stop. Touching everything. This is an ancient tomb. The book itself already explained how careful you're supposed to be. The instant the blazing blue beetle touched Dr. Dan Garrett, he felt the change. He sensed the power of the jeweled scarab, felt limitless strength in himself when he held that stone. I feel it. The power, incredible power, and it is mine to use. I hear voices whispering down through the centuries. I don't think hearing voices is generally a good thing. And if auditory hallucinations weren't enough, Dan starts seeing things. He dreams that he is transformed back in time to meet the most magnificent of the great and good pharaohs. He is also wearing the Blue Beetle costume, which in this continuity seems to be a spandex bodysuit with red gloves, a red stripe on his head, a belt to hold the scarab, and kicking shades. This is based on the original 1T Garrett's costume, though his was more of a tunic and was depicted as being a material that resembled chain mail rather than plain blue spandex. He also wore a domino mask rather than the glasses. His accent color was also originally yellow, though it was changed to red later. DC usually depicts Dan in a variation of the older costume instead of this one, going so far as to show the yellow accented version of the costume in The Brave and the Bold. I can think of maybe two occurrences in recent years of Dan having the sunglasses-like mask instead of the domino, for example, and in both cases the look is corrected when he is shown again in those books. This costume, however, works much better to show off his butt. The pharaoh tells Dan that he is now the holder of the power of the sacred blue beetle scarab, so long as he uses it wisely. He tells Dan that he must fight Ka Efri and his modern-day conspirator, and to beware the white-hot light, for this is the beginning!
Dan snaps out of it, and hearing the sound of a jet outside, uses the first of his many superpowers, and also the first of many that make him feel at times to be no more than a Superman ripoff, X-ray vision. Dan, like Superman, will have many powers by the end of this series. Dan not only sees that the plane is a bomber, but also sees inside that it is carrying a nuclear bomb. Larry thinks they're doomed, but Dan spots a conveniently placed lead-lined tomb Kaifri had built. Yes, I'm serious. Kaifri, nonsensically, had a lead-lined tomb built into his burial site. Why? Even if he really could have predicted this scenario, why would he want to save the intruders into his tomb? And how does a lead lining protect them from the explosive force of the blast? Or the radiation after they leave? Did nobody understand nuclear bombs in the 60s? Dan now transforms into the Blue Beetle for the first time in reality, yelling, KAJIDA! And I should note that this is spelt differently from how DC spelled it in Jaime's series, where the H is in the second word here. After transforming, he awkwardly throws himself through the doorway, using what I can only imagine is super strength or something like that, into the lead-lined chamber, making the whole thing completely pointless, since it will now be exposed to the radiation anyway, and then transforms back to normal. Get ready! The hydrogen bomb is about to explode! The curse of the tomb of Kaifri is about to come true! End of chapter one! I would question another Silver Age oddity that is chapter breaks, but it makes a weird sort of sense here, as you'll see, because we have a new story first. Jungle Waters! Victoria Falls in the Zambezi River in Africa is one of the greatest cataracts in the world. It is a mile wide and 400 feet high, twice as high as Niagara Falls. The Congo River is 3,000 miles long, well, only three quarters as long as the Nile. The Congo's volume is second only to the Amazon. <gasps> lake Victoria in eastern Africa is the second largest freshwater lake in the world, the largest being our own Lake Superior. Lake Victoria is 250 miles long and 200 miles wide. Tropical storms make it extremely dangerous for travel. Wait, that wasn't a story. That was more like an educational lecture. Well, at least the lettering was better. But now we're back to the main story. Chapter 2, The Birth of Evil. A Menotep supersonic bomber gets a nukin, and we get our white-hot light. Did the general know about the prophecy, or is he just majorly overreacting? In the great mastaba of the evil pharaoh, directly below that searing blast, an ancient hieroglyphic prophecy came true! As the heat melted the mummy case, leaving the mummy intact, mind you, as the atomic light seared the best salt altar itself, the mummy, 4,000 years old, was suddenly a living thing! I don't care if Dan was right. This was still an insane conclusion to jump to. And here we have our titular giant mummy who was not dead. And all right, so prophecy rose the mummy. But how is anyone else alive? There were holes in the door, and the entryway is clearly damaged enough for the mummy to just waltz right in. And again, the blast was powerful enough to melt the sarcophagus. Dan, it's alive, and it's so huge. It is living and growing every second. That atomic light is doing it. Oh, come on. He's not that big. Ooh. Kaifri prophesied that the white-hot light would bring him back to life. It is my guess that General Menotep knew this, and his hydrogen bomb was exploded deliberately to accomplish this. If only I could remember the phrase I must use to... I remember it, Lurie! Wow. That sure was tense for a half second there. Kaji Da! Dan takes off with a mighty zoom! And is confronted by another of Amanotep's aircraft. The pilot tries to shoot Dan, but he is impervious to bullets. The pilot suddenly receives a telepathic message. Words of fire in his brain, which were, Abandon your aircraft, puppet of evil, or else! And Dan proceeds to fire an energy beam from his hands, destroying the craft probably far too close to the ejected pilot. 
Dan spots the mummy and the general, far in the distance, with eye beams that indicate that the fantastic vision of the blue beetle penetrated walls and vaulted across space. Amenhotep greets the mummy, suggesting a villainous team-up. Our aims are the same, dead pharaoh, but he's clearly not dead. You sought to rule the world 6,000 years ago. Wasn't he 4,000 years old a few pages ago? And now I seek that dream. Together we will reign. With modern weapons, we will institute a reign of evil. Isn't it great when the bad guys just outright say that they're evil? We cut to Dan in one of the goofiest flying poses you've ever seen. I'd better have a talk with Amenhotep right now. Oh, that rascal. Raising the dead. Dan confronts the two, saying that Lori is working on deciphering the hieroglyphics that will explain how to return the mummy to his slumber. But... The mummy gives Dan the evil eye! Suddenly, caught with a warning, the blue beetle felt a sudden chill. An evil coldness from the tomb held him paralyzed. He could not lift his eyes, nor move a finger to fight the evil power of Kaifri. Dan slumps to the ground, and Amenhotep reasons that the scarab may be the source of Dan's power. Freaks of nature! The platypus! found in the Australian Alps, is truly the most unusual living paradox. Yeah, there was a chapter break for another random bit of education there. But back to the story. Chapter 3, The Mummy's Return. He didn't go anywhere. Minotep fantasizes about his not-dead pal smashing up cities while Lurie makes her way there, sensing that Dan is in danger. She finds him at an altar with the mummy looming overhead. Despite the fact that the mummy is right there and can easily smoosh them, he instead loads 4,000, is it 4,000 or 6,000, years of loathing into his lethal stare. Lurie is able to snap Dan out of it, though, and he wakes up, ready to fight again. Despite still being transformed, Dan still yells out, Kajida! again. Then the blue beetle faced the awful power of the evil pharaoh, the eyes with the beams of hate. The blue beetle's mind reeled before the power of the grave. Then, despite the fact the caption talked about eye beams, the mummy slams a fist down, finally going in for the smoosh. But Dan isn't having any of it. He dodges, flies up, and socks the mummy in the face. A mass of superpowers at his command, and Dan opts to punch the mummy in the face. The mummy narrowly misses Dan again, and he realizes it's going to take more than just a punch. Got to get up speed! Hit him harder! His powers are almost the equal of mine! So Dan picks up speed with another ZOOM! And flies double fists forward right into the mummy's chin. This is apparently enough. Yes, the climactic fight was all of a punch and a really fast punch. The mummy falls back to the ground, shrinking back to his original size. And wait, wasn't Lurie supposed to decipher some hieroglyphics to find out how to turn him back to normal? I kinda doubt they just said, punch him in the face real good. Will he ever be able to come back to life again, Blue Beetle? It took radiation from a hydrogen bomb to activate it, Lurie. I'm going to put him back in the Mastaba, so deep in the radiation-proof chamber that no light will ever shine on the mummy again. Unless, you know, someone digs him out. No sooner said than done, for a man of Blue Beetle's unbelievable attributes. I'll seal this permanently! Putting a thick slab into the door, the Blue Beetle's eyes focused heat. Great enough to fuse the door into one solid mass of rock. He'll never be seen by the eyes of man again. That is, until DC retells the story in Secret Origins number two. Dan then goes off to take care of Amenhotep's weapon stockpile, using his most powerful attack, flying into stuff so fast that it explodes. Dan somehow revisits the dreamscape of the good Pharaoh and asks if he'll be taking the power back, but the Pharaoh says he's proved himself worthy. Dan returns to Lurie, who asks the guy she's just met if he loves her. You must know that I am not free to love, lovely woman of the Nile. I have a sacred mission. I am the bearer of the sacred scarab, and I must be ready when I am called. I don't remember the part where the pharaoh said you couldn't have a girlfriend. Yes, if you are threatened by evil somewhere in the world, do not despair. Have hope, for the blue beetle will come to you and use his great powers to save mankind. Zoom! There are a few more things in this book. A prose story and a final educational piece. This time a three-page story about what we've learned from fossil records. But that's not why we're here. So there you have it, folks. The first story of this version of the Blue Beetle. 
Can't you see from the quality of this story how the Blue Beetle name lives on to this day? I hope you enjoyed my review. This is the first time I've ever done anything like this. I will say that this issue is probably a bit more boring than the others, since there's so much setup and not as much continuity to screw up yet, so I hope that if you're on the fence about me, you'll still tune in next time for issue two and beyond. Thanks for watching!